Good evening and thank you all for joining our last talk of 2023. You are the, 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 the last people standing, very stalwart um, supporters. Um, I'm extremely grateful to Nicholas. He's a fellow MGS member and he stepped in to replace our scheduled speaker, Bart O'Brien. He was called away overseas and he was slightly worried about having internet connection and also he wasn't really in control of his particular schedule. So I understood that. Nicholas is English born, as you will hear from his impeccable um, oh. talking. Um, but he's and strangely not very, very Americanized for somebody who's been resident in the United States for about 39 years. He came to his profession via farming, ships and falconry. But by now he's been around the world of nurseries and plants for 30 or so years. He's currently company spokesman for Iver de Growers. This is a major player employing over 2,500 people in 15 farms, nearly 7,000 acres in production, growing 33 million plants and 5,000 varietals a, day, a, a year. Uh, he previously worked with Monrovia as the new plants program director, and he knows exactly how this industry works from the inside and top down. Um, tonight, he's going to talk about the EVRD's operations, its new plant production program, how it works with breeders and also around the world. He'll discuss current, current plant trends, cultural shifts in America, talk about some of the planting restrictions and water issues facing California, and the University of California landscape irrigation trials. Um, he's gonna suggest some good plant choices for the Southwest region of America and other low water garden areas and his recommended book and magazine list. So that's a lot for you to get through and us to get through. <laughs> so without further ado, um, I will hand over to you, Nicholas, if you'd like to share your um, screen. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us. Okay, terrific. Uh, can, can you see everything? Yes, that's perfect. And you can hear me okay? Yep. Terrific. So f first off, thank you so much for inviting me. This is really a privilege. And I really do enjoy the group on these uh, presentations that we all get to see are terrific. My presentation is really quite different. And the norm is that we, we have very highly accomplished landscape architects or designers who talk about these fabulous gardens that are in Europe or other places around the world. Um, we had a young lady whose name I must confess I didn't write down, who does, uh, she's English and did a lot of work in, uh, in Greece. So we saw these great gardens. I'm gonna take you on a journey about some of the things that are going on in America right now. And this is a this is a, a very exciting time to be in plants in America. Uh, very often I'll read the term the golden, the golden age of plants, which some people said kind of back in the late 1800s. And I think in America right now that we're in the golden age of plants today. It's just fantastic. Uh, I, I fell into the plant business quite by mistake. I'm not a born and bred gardener. Uh, I didn't grow up from tender years in plants. I fell into plants probably in my early 30s. And I can remember as a child being drug into uh, my grandmother's garden on the, on the uh, on my father's side, I come from a group of doctors, being made to weed and pull dead plants and all this sort of thing and plant live plants. So I never really cared for it, but quite by chance, I fell into the business, uh, was offered a job in the nursery business, happened to be in the right place at the right time. So it seemed a good idea at the time. So agriculture, which I started off in, and horticulture were firmly joined at the hip. So within a few days, I'd just taken um, a great liking to what I was doing. So I've, I've been very fortunate to work for, you know, just a couple of companies while I've been in the States. And Averdi Growers, <clears throat> the group I'm with now, is a very new company. Um, this is uh, our 
uh, December is our third year. We're a conglomeration of uh, three or four different companies which have been purchased by a very young man who loves plants. So we're family owned, we're not publicly held. And as Angela mentioned, we've got a number of nurseries across America. We farm in Oregon, California. This is a picture of the Oregon facility. The nurseries are very, very structured and they're highly regulated as to what we can use on the nurseries. They're all closed systems. We have to recycle our entire water uh, area. Water cannot leave the property. Uh, this particular nursery in Oregon has an underground canal around the nursery. And then we have these massive reservoirs that we store water on site. So, which really help us during the um, summer season. We can, yeah, you know, we probably recycle about 60, 70% of our water. And then during the winter time, we need that space of water so we can keep the water from running off the farm. In the Southern California nurseries in Florida, they're completely different. It's a, a much um, more tropical, less hardy group of plants. And uh, the picture on the top left-hand side is down in a place called Fallbrook, um, which is about 600 acres. And there we, um, there we grow um, gardenias, bougainvilleas, hibiscus, all those sorts of plants. Florida in the bottom right-hand uh, area is unique. It's about 600 acres and they grow palms and they grow palms from like four feet high to 30 feet high and they grow palms like corn. There's no other way to describe it. And on this 16, uh, on the 600 acre nursery, they only have about 40 people. So it's, uh, it's a very, um, it's a very interesting organization in the, in the other farms, it's about one person per acre. The palm farms, it's very different. You plant them and you you let the plants grow. <clears throat> We're heavily into new plants. Um, probably about somewhere between 16 and 20% of all the plants we sell on an annual basis are, are new. And what's even more interesting is that the, the whole plant business has changed worldwide. So we work with... Um, breeders, hybridizers, plant explorers. And I'm going to introduce you to some key people in our industry, not only in America, but worldwide as well. And of course, these companies have sprung up. Plants have become extraordinarily valuable, which, which is great because the hardest part is to see get people to see the value in plants. So anyway, this is one group we deal with called Think Plants, and they just have all sorts of you know, lilies or perennials or hostas, whatever it might be, that they're collecting on a national basis. And then for every plant we sell that um, that we get from a plant like, uh, from a group like Think Plants, we pay them a royalty. And the royalty then goes back into the system and it, it allows the breeders and the explorers to continue the work they do. So I, I was fascinated and the last presentation, the young lady was talking about Greece and she started talking about leucophyllums or Texas rangers that she's using on some of her jobs. So with the new plant business, it's not just about new plants. It's about going back in time and discovering and bringing some of these plants, which are absolute winners and can be great foundation plants, bringing these into the um, into the, uh, the searchlight, if you like. And here's a great example. Two plants I'm going to talk about. This is a, um, a leucophyllum called Convent. Convent was introduced about 40 years ago and was actually bred down in San Antonio in Texas. And it was bred on a vegetable. It was a USDA, United States uh, Department of Agriculture, um, vegetable breeding site. <clears throat> and the senior vegetable breeder decided he was going to try his hand at leucophyllums because they grow naturally down there. So created this great variety called Convent, which is probably the silverest of all the uh, Texas ranges. The foliage is unique. It's a large, uh, a large leaf compared to many. And it has this wonderful, bright sort of pink colored amethyst flower. And the other guy and plant I wanted to mention immortalizes a gentleman called uh, Lynn Lowry. Lynn Lowry was a Texas professor and a great plantsman uh, right the way through the Southwest. His great chance discovery that he found in the middle of a field one day is a leucophyllum he called Lynn's Legacy. 
And what is unique about this particular variety, um, leucophallums are a great barometer of when we're going to get rain. So maybe like a week, you know, six days before we're going to get some rain, you'll notice that all the leucophallums start flowering. Um, they're sensing this moisture change in the in the air. So Lynn's legacy is unique in the fact that it doesn't need that higher moisture in the air to bloom. So this is just a terrific plant. Um, I just hope plants like this, we can um, somehow figure out how to get to Europe. And a couple of other plants, this is a yucca filamentosa that is available in Europe. This is a much hardier variety, but has a unique color change. This is a perennial yucca. So uh, on about that third or fourth year, once the plant's established, you'll get this great um, flag of flowers that comes up. And then as the flowers die, you need to cut the stalk down and keep the plant nice and healthy. You get this great color change also in the leaves during the colder weather. And a, a new variety at the other end of the scale is a Gloriosa called Bright Star. And uh, Bright Star is produced by tissue culture which is a, a, another presentation on how plants are created. But what mm. is unique about this is it's very difficult to produce plants using this uh, laboratory process. It's very difficult to keep the variegation in the plants, but some bright spark figured out how to do that. So um, I've got uh, two plants in my garden. Um, uh, they're, they're terrific when they bloom, but I you've got to be patient. So they normally take about four or five years before you'll see a flower on them. So America is, is broken down into numerous regions. And uh, I actually live in California. So uh, I, I'm out here. So if you can see my cursor. And um, it, it's really the desert. You know, a lot of people think this is a you know, very kind of sort of tropical area. It's not. It's dry and it can have harsh planting conditions. So. You know, we live and die by the water. I thought it might be fun just to talk about one couple of particular places in California. So if some of you make the pilgrimage out here, spring is a wonderful time to come. And your visit can be uh, even, um, even better if we've had some good winter rains and early spring rains. This is a brand new national monument that was created back in 2017. It's north, uh, northwest of Palm Springs out in the desert. It's 157,000 acres. And I had the good fortune to visit there a couple of years ago, um, just after the area was cordoned off or created, we'll call it. Um, it's so new, they're still establishing the entry points. But um, I visited there with three botanists, and they had actually discovered um, 27 new varieties uh, or species uh, selections of plants from the genuses. So, uh, and they all dis um, discovered these terrific um, petroglyphs and hieroglyphs that were uh, painted in the caves by the Native Americans from years and years ago. If you go there at the right time of year, which is after we've had the rains, the flower displays are absolutely eye-watering. You know, I must confess, I'm I'm fairly good with plants, but you know, on a lot of these plants, I have to carry a book with me, and then I still don't know what I'm looking at. The flower displays are spe uh, spectacular. This is a, a unique variety of plant called a, a desert mallow or spiralsia. Um, but this is one of the biggest I've ever seen. The plant was about five to six feet high and 12 feet across. And of course, the flower description speaks for itself. What was unique about this picture, and I didn't see it until I actually put it up on a screen was in the background, you'll notice those beautiful blue flowers. Those are desert delphiniums. I never knew we had such a creature. And uh, so again, lots of new plants to learn. This year, we had a marvelous display of wildflowers in California. To really get a great flower display, the water needs to get into the ground about 16 to 18 inches. And that's when we have a great flower display. These are California poppies, and then uh, California bluebells as well. As you travel north, uh, you get into higher ground, 1,000, 1,500 feet. You get into the Joshua uh, National Tree Park, which is uh, on the way to Las Vegas. If you've, if you've never been to Las Vegas, um, uh, make sure your credit card is fully loaded. You have to go there just once. It's kind of fun. 
But on the way there, uh, on the drive, on the 15 freeway, you'll pass through Joshua National Tree. And the plant on the left-hand side is probably about 200 years old. And it is spiritually moving. There is no other way to describe it. To walk through these magnificent statues of these plants, um, from from seedlings that naturally occur uh, in the ground that manage to uh, germinate, in about one in about two hundred plants actually manages to thrive. So, of course, the um, the main enemy of these uh, great plants is fire and also the weather change that we are experiencing all over the world. And then you get up into the high Sierras, you know, you're getting up into sort of uh, into the high country, fabulous displays of wildflowers. This is a native perennial called Indian paintbrush. This one is actually in production and it's called Applegate's paintbrush, just fabulous. So it's really key to talk about people. And we, we work with a whole group of people. I thought it might be fun to you to meet my wife, uh, affectionately known as Sweetie Pie, the only woman that I've ever been in love with that comes home smelling of cordite. But on a more serious note, these are two icons in uh, our, our plants in the Southwest. The top left-hand picture is a guy called Randy Baldwin. Randy uh, has a super nursery called San Marcos Grows in Santa Barbara. And unfortunately, San Marcos Grows is in uh, its final couple of years. So uh, make sure you visit with him when you come over. A great, he's a very engaging man, very free of his time, very free of his knowledge, just a wonderful person. And a little known man on the right-hand side is probably one of the icons of plant discovery and plant breeding of indigenous plants out here, Mr. Ron Gass. Ron, was the owner of a company called Mountain Estates Wholesale Nursery. The, uh, he, he, he has brought to market many, many plants. When he originally started doing uh, plant exploration, he and a friend uh, would actually uh, take a motorbike and sidecar, and they'd just drive across the border down into Mexico. And they used to look into the desert areas and find these communities of plants in swales, um, way off the beaten track that had interbred with each other. And they would tie cotton on the flowers and then they would go back in the autumn or the late summer to collect the seeds. They knew where the cotton was. You know, they knew where they get their plants from. He is, he is well known for uh, the Husparella breeding program or red flowering uh, yucca program. Uh, now, I don't know if you're growing these plants in down around the Mediterranean, but personally, I think they would do extremely well and uh, somehow have to figure out how to get you some seed over to try them. So hasparellas get tall, they get large, they get very clumpy, they can be quite, you know, slightly ungainly. So a plant that's four or five years old, you know, in bloom might be five to six feet high and take an area of four to five feet in, uh, in the garden. So what Ron has done, he's bred sort of slightly smaller plants. This is Pink Parade, very upright variety, fabulous pink flower, very long season of bloom. Most of his plants are seedless, so they have a very long blooming period. And what's absolutely unique about Pink Parade is that most of the uh, stalks of Hasparellas, they don't have branches. Pink Parade has branches. So you've got quadrupled the flowers on the plants. This is uh, PD. PD was uh, one of the chaps that worked for him. The, the farm where they bred these plants is down on the border of Mexico and Arizona. So very harsh, very dry, uh, very, low, uh, very low nutrient ground, which is exactly what the Hasparellas grow. This is, uh, one, uh, this is, a, a, bra this is a color breakthrough uh, called Desert Dusk. Um, this is the only purple flowering uh, Hasparella on the market today. Smaller, only about three feet high, very fine foliage, uh, long bloom. The flowers never fully open, so they hold on the stem for a long time. You really have to go in once a year and prune the flower stalks off. Um, Angela? Yes, sorry. Um, uh, can you just tell, what does PP28910? Oh, does it so, thank, refer to? That, thank you so much. So a lot of the plants that um, are created are patented. And so uh, the PP means plant pattern. Mm. And there's, there's a lot of schools of thought. There's people who disagree with this. I understand that. 
but there are people that agree with it because um, the, the plant patent lasts for about 20 years. So anything with a PP on it creates a royalty stream that goes back to the breeder um, or, or the company. That's, uh, and when you have a, a name, uh, Desert Dusk, with a registered mark on it, then a company can actually own the name of the plant. And they can license other people to produce these plants or use the name, but then there's a, there's a monetary stream that um, that surrounds that. Okay. Intellectual property is uh, is a bit is a big thing in America. It, it's a big thing all over the world in plants now. And then the last Hasparilla, which I had to mention, is one called Sandia Glow, and this is the reddest of all the Hasparillas. And uh, this flower has a wax coating on it. Uh, the flower, the plant will start blooming in the late summer and will stop in the early spring. So in the warmer climates, you can have this uh, right the way through the cooler seasons. The hardiness zone on this is, and I'm going to do this in Fahrenheit because I know you chaps are in, um, in uh, centigrade, I think. The hardiness zone on this is probably about sort of 15 to 20 below Fahrenheit. So extremely hardy and also will live quite happily in 116, 120 degree weather. So the scope of their survivability is fantastic. Jim Folsom, had to mention Jim, uh, the Mediterranean Garden Society, when we had our do over here a couple of three years ago, Jim was kind enough to host us at the Huntington Library. Uh, he retired a year or so ago, but um, wanders back in uh, on a rainy or a sunny day. So we still get to see him from time to time, uh, a, a unique guy. Dan Hinckley, I had to mention Dan. I, I, was, I had the good fortune to work under Dan's leadership on plant exploration in, uh, when he was working for the old company I worked for. And he was exploring in um, Taiwan, Japan, China, Tibet, Mongolia, Northern India, South Africa, South America. He's actually in South America right now. One of the most humble men I've ever met. And he, he, he's famous. There's no other way to describe it. And um, he is, again, giving, very humble, very giving of his time, his expertise. So there's really been some great opportunity to work with him. Here's a typical of example. This is a picture taken in northern Myanmar. And uh, the Chinese border is where the mountains are. This is typical of the type of forest that he's looking for plants in, exploring in. And uh, he has uh, um, trekkers or tribesmen who would guide him through the area. It's only recently that um, plant exploration has been allowed in northern Myanmar. It's run by the junta, run by the military. And the, and the local tribesmen have been warring with the junta for years and years. And I think the history book reflects that the tribesmen have been doing pretty well against the military. You know, they use things like poisoned arrows and stuff like that. So, but anyway, Dan uh, has been doing uh, quite a bit of plant exploration back there. Denny Werner, uh, again, is an icon in trees. And Denny on the right and his plantsman Lane on the left. Uh, he has been working extensively with red buds or cercis. Um, there are, are many different varieties he's been working in, and one of uh, he's got several creations on the market. One of the most impressive is a cercis called uh, Melo, and he crossed forest pansy, which has uh, red leaves, beautiful pink flowers in the early spring. Cercis for us are normally an understory tree or edge of woodland. And uh, they get to be about 18 feet high, 20 feet across. They're great for a smaller, medium-sized garden. He crossed forest pansy with a Texas red bud called Texanensis. And Texanensis is bone hardy. I've seen plants that thrive in full sun, which is highly unusual. So the leaves are heavily textured, very drought tolerant. So this is going to put uh, these uh, whole collection of red buds into a new um, sphere. The plant I had to mention, which is antique, there's no other way to describe it, and uh, originates from Judea, actually originates from southern Israel, is called Bodenum. This plant was given the Award of Garden Merit by the Royal Horticultural Society many, many years ago. And we're just starting 
to produce it. And actually all our all the uh, all the budding uh, and grafting is done for us in southern Israel by a super chap called Omar Hoshberg. What is unique about this particular variety is it's a little more ungainly. Um, you can see by the picture on the right hand side, you know, it's kind of it spreads, doesn't have that really fine branch structure like a lot of the cercis do, but is a blooming machine in the early spring. As the plant reaches maturity, you can't see the branches for the flowers. It's spectacular. And it's a zone hardier. So normally, um, for us, it's a USDA zone 7, right, which is probably about sort of 15, 15 Fahrenheit. So this plant's a zone 6. So this is going to go below freezing. So we're very excited for that because it's going to increase the range. Pete Oldorf, the famous Dutch designer, is finally beginning to make his mark in America. And he's going to change how we look at our landscapes. He and Noel Kingsbury, some other people, uh, are uh, on this um, new perennial look, uh, which is really driving how we change some of our landscapes. The uh, He's done some famous gardens in America. This is the Lowry Garden, which is in Chicago. The Lowry Garden uh, is a is a um, a, a large um, a large facility, but Pete's Garden, which is seven acres, this is the largest rooftop garden in the world, and it sits on top of a parking garage, which is underground. And uh, people who live in the apartments or the work in the office buildings, you know. They will frequent this garden, and you can see the great color change through the season. Pete is known for 365-day, uh, round-the-year gardens. So regardless of when you go in there, spring, summer, autumn, winter, something is going on in the garden. Only once a year do they go in and prune the gardens. That's in the early spring. So any seeds that have fallen on the ground, They'll prune, they'll mulch, these seeds are allowed to germinate. So the garden is naturally regenerating. The High Line, which is one of the more famous gardens in America, it's, uh, it's a, there's a presentation just behind this one. It, it was an above ground railroad track and um, uh, it actually was gonna be torn down and they decided to make it into a public space. Pete Oldorf, fortunately, was asked to do the plant mix. Um, they have something like, I don't know, one or two million people a year uh, that visit this garden. If you're in New York, this is the place to go. So again, whether you're spring, summer, autumn, then there's something going on there. And the other great thing is the amount of pollinators that have been attracted to this garden is absolutely fantastic. A must have on your book, uh, in your book library is uh, um, by uh, Pete and Noel Kingsbury called Planting. You know, even if you don't, even if you don't read the narrative, the pictures are absolutely fantastic. So um, we, we thought it would be fun to talk about trends. So uh, the Oasis Garden, um, this is becoming a, a, a big trend uh, in the southwestern region and certainly a lot of areas because the gardens are becoming much smaller. Land values are just growing through the roof. So this actually, the pictures in front of you are one of the naturally occurring oasises which are south of Palm Springs, back in the mountain. You know, again, if you're out, this would be a great place to visit. It's a great hike. You can sit by these waters. Um, and, you know, if you're really lucky, you'll get to see a bighorn sheep. The bighorn sheep come down there for a drink in the really hot weather. So uh, the water situation in the southwest is grim. Uh, this is Lake Mead, which supplies Las Vegas. Las Vegas still continues to be one of the fastest growing cities in the United States of America. And believe it or not, for a couple of years was the number one destination worldwide. More people were going to Las Vegas than any other. Lake Mead is now a shadow of its former self. And you can see by the picture on the left-hand side, sort of the bathtub line, if I'll use that terrible expression, that you can see the bathtub line where the water used to be. Now in the dams, they're actually uh, drilling holes lower in the dams to extract the water to drive the turbines that provide electricity for Las Vegas. So um, it's reckoned it would take something like 20 or 30 years for this, uh, for this uh, lake to fill up to its natural level or the naturally occurring level uh, with, not, with uh, regular rainfall every year. So, so the jury's out on this. 
if water in Las Vegas is unrecyclable, then uh, you, you are not allowed to plant plants. So this is, a, this is what's happening on the freeways. The freeways used to be full of plants for people to enjoy, trees, shrubs, whatever it might be. And now it's just gravel. So uh, of course, these people who design all these freeways and the gravel, it's raising the ground temperatures. So no one thinks about that. By 2026, all the grass has to be moved unless it's um, a playing field or a park or something like that. So you are no longer allowed to have grass in your garden or your private space. Bottom right hand picture, of course, what's becoming very popular is um, fake grass or it's really, it looks, it's beautiful, but I tell you, it gets so hot and it's very hard to keep cool. So the people that install this fake grass say, well, we can put a sprinkler system in there for you as well, but you're not allowed to do that. Um, and I think we're going to see the same thing happen in Southern California as well. So what's happening is with this oasis garden, the gardens are going to be brought much closer to the house. Um, they're going to be smaller areas. There's going to be intensive gardening. And uh, anything that's outside a certain circumference is just going to be bare dirt. So, you know, trees are going to become more important. Um, longer blooming plants will become more important. And, and I guess the other great thing is this can be become the third room or the fourth room, whatever it might be. Water will be key. Uh, water is so important for birds, wildlife, pollinators. So every garden has to have the water. You have to figure out how... You can do that. The, uh, the University of California Davis has got a unique program in the trialing and evaluation of plants, which we are, we are, I'm part of an advisory group that works with this. We're trying to broaden this um, into the cooler regions, the colder states of America, and into Arizona, New Mexico, and West Texas. Here's a typical trial. The trials normally last between two and three years. Plants are Plants are, there's a hole that's dug, the plant is put in the hole, there's no soil, uh, no uh, organic soil added, just the natural soil is put back into the hole, three inches of organic mulch is added, and then the plants go on a, on a, on a low, medium, or high water schedule, and the water is strictly monitored. They receive about three waterings a year, depending on high, medium, and water. Uh, sorry, high, medium, and uh, low. They receive three cycles of water a year. Their growth is monitored. The, uh, the measurements of the plants, the care and attention of the plants is monitored by the master gardeners, which are under the umbrella of the university. So what we're finding in some of these trials is absolutely fantastic. Um, we're really learning how little water some of these plants uh, do need. And other plants that we thought would never survive in this climate, and an example in the bottom right-hand picture is a grama grass, uh, a butaluya, called Blonde Ambition. Blonde Ambition has taken the market by storm. The plant was originally discovered at 7,500 feet outside Santa Fe, New Mexico, on a place called Romesa, is absolutely thriving in Southern California. We're even more surprised that the plant sets its beautiful seeds. Um, and it's non-invasive. Um, it doesn't, uh, the seeds don't germinate once they hit the ground. So um, normally, you know, up in Santa Fe, you're, you're probably going to get six to 700 uh, chilling hours a year, which is when you're down in the 40s. Down in Southern California, Northern California, <clears throat> we only get maybe 100 or 150 chilling hours a year. And the plant is thriving. So we're, we're learning a lot. Containers remain extremely popular, and we're seeing uh, we're seeing a complete change. We're seeing the annualization of perennials. Used to be in containers that was petunias, marigolds, you know, annuals, these sorts of plants. Now we're seeing a lot of perennials, whether they're hardy perennials or tender perennials. The plant that we're looking at is called uh, it's a salvia called Armistad. So, uh, Armistad is a big salvia, four to five feet high more on the uh, tropical side, uh, but the plant uh, will, was discovered probably oh, about 10, 15 years ago, performs beautifully in a container and the warmer climates will bloom year round. And of course, um, I've got some friends 
who I tried to get into container gardening because they won't they won't spend the time with a bigger garden. So I bought them a container, plants, everything. And of course, once their dog had slept in it, that was it. No plants in the container. And somehow I'm going to get that container back in my own garden. But the Denver Botanical Garden, which has a terrific collaboration between uh, the State University, Colorado University, and the garden. We're going to talk about their plant program. Their container plantings in the uh, garden itself are fantastic. What they've done is they've taken plants from the various regions of Colorado and put these into uh, the containers. Each plant you see has a sign so you can read what's in there. And of course, if you have a broken container, use those in the garden, put them somewhere. You can put a plant inside and then the plant will grow out towards the sunlight. It's just fantastic. The choice, the selection, there is something for everyone. Succulents have become very popular. They became very trendy six or seven years ago and have really swept into a cultural shift. They're available all over America in the garden centers. And for those people that have just a patio or a porch, really don't have a garden whatsoever, the textures and the colors and the colors of containers you can use are fantastic. These are, these are the sorts of plants that get people interested. Sky gardening, if I can use that term, is a, is a big trend in America. People have very small gardens. They're coming up with these really cool ideas of how to use that space. This is agave americana. The plants will probably live quite happily in these containers three, maybe four years. Um, it's a great choice for the container. However, the plants will end up getting six feet high and about 12 feet across. They're an absolute monster. So I guess he's going to have to give them to uh, neighbors who've got more land. And then uh, the, the absolute raging trend is metal containers. If you've got a house that's a little bit more on the contemporary style, the modernistic type style, these are terrific. Animal troughs come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. They're very easy. You can change the crops out. And if you're plagued with gophers, then, um, which we are at home where I live, we, we, ha we have a very healthy population of gophers, right? Uh, and if you have a healthy population of gophers in the, in the hills where I live, it means that you also have a very healthy population of rattlesnakes because a gopher is the favorite food of the rattlesnake. Gardening in containers with more fruit. This is the Maya lemon. Maya lemon is probably the number one citrus. Citrus have become this uh, so popular all over America, regardless of whether you're living in the cold country or the warm country. Of course, the warmer you are, you can use them in ground. People have figured out how to overwinter them in a garage. They've have figured out how to overwinter them uh, in a sunroom. This is a great variety called Maya lemon, which was discovered back in the 30s. Uh, no one really knows what the cross is, but I think it's a cross between a lemon and a tangerine. The original plant was found in Bakersfield, California. Plants will fruit every second year reliably. The, the, the smooth, they're very smooth, as you can see, and they probably have about 25% more juice than any other citrus that's available on the market today. So um, I make lots of lemonade. You can literally, here I am in the kitchen, uh, you can literally cut the plant, uh, cut the fruit in half, squeeze it into a container, add your iced water, and away you go. No need to add sweetener or sugar or anything like that. Tropicals, container plants, uh, again, are sweeping across America. I thought it might be fun just to show you a couple of varieties. Uh, the Trade Wind series, which is by far the most popular. All the breeding is done in Southern California. <clears throat> and I have no doubt this program is found in Europe as well. It's so popular. These are smaller hibiscus, uh, larger flowers, clusters of flowers. They actually come in bouquets. The other great thing about the breeding program is the petals are self-supporting. It used to be with the tropical hibiscus that there was a gap between the petals and in a day they're just dead falter, but the flowers will last two or three days. So they're becoming very popular people. We use them in ground in the warmer regions. And then once you get into the colder regions, they use them as annuals. They're really not worth trying to winter over. And then Angela and I were talking about mandevillas and I, I wanted to show you one brand new variety. Um, this, I, I, I would think this is available in Europe because it was uh, bred in Japan. 
This is called Sunbeam. This plant you're looking at is three years old. I was fortunate enough, uh, enough to get uh, one of the first plants that came into America. The plant is in a, a 12 inch container. I have never pruned it. So you're probably about eight to nine inches high and about two to two and a half feet across. And where I am, uh, I'll have flowers on the plant um, 10 months out of the year. It, it's an absolute delight. I put it on a, an upturned uh, container so it can cascade down and looks absolutely fantastic. Monty Don, I tell you, I'm happily married, but if I have a male heartthrob, it's Monty Don. This guy is the cat's meow, and I'm sure all of you at some point have, have followed him. If you don't, I'd really encourage it to you. Monty Don talks about the history of gardens. He talks about years and years ago, how gardens were the signs of great wealth. You know, if you were someone with lots of money, uh, you had a big garden and it wasn't five acres. It was like um, anywhere from like 25 to 100 to 200 acres. Water was key in all these gardens. So um, the bishops, the popes, the aristocrat, uh, aristocrats, the kings and the queens had these fantastic gardens. Now everything has changed. Now, in, in the last 10 to 15 years, plants have become extraordinarily popular. They really have more people interested in gardening than ever before. Gardening is absolutely on the precipice of opportunity. In parts of the uh, areas in America, you see these fabulous murals that people have uh, planted on the, on the sides of old buildings or blighted areas. It's just incredible. I thought, here's just one example of a mural in, uh, in downtown Chicago. It's a, the tree is real, but of course the painting is fantastic. In secret locations, whether in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, New York, Boston, Atlanta, on Saturday mornings and sometimes all day, groups of youngsters will gather in warehouses where these massive plant auctions occur. You grab a paper plate, you're given a number, and so you bid on these plants as they come up for auction. Indoor plants have become extraordinarily valuable. Here's a philodendron, a variegated variety. Just as one example, if you go on the internet where a lot of the auctions happen, uh, this is a six inch plant that you're looking at. And the bidding starts at $1,100. Uh, and it's all about the variegation on the plant. This is, this is what drives the value. Recently, one of these plants was sold for $6,000. $400. Who would ever have thought that type of money? So with this, we're seeing this new breed of plants people, getting people interested in plants, an icon uh, in insects and the insect world and bringing nature into your garden is Doug Tallamy. We had the good fortune to have Doug present for us uh, two years ago at one of our events. We had about 600 people online who came to listen to him. Doug is a, he's an educator. He is an author. Um, what he talks about is bringing these pollinators into your garden and the type of plants that you can use. Um, lots of different, whether it's honeybees, butterflies, talks about the swallowtails, which is in the top left-hand picture, and then the monarch butterfly on the right-hand side. He is so keen. He is starting a homegrown national park um, process. Uh, we have a series of national parks all across America. You might have heard of Yosemite, a very well-known national park in Northern California. What Doug Tallamy wants to create is a network of gardens across America. Each garden has to reach a certain criteria and then turn this into a national park. Lots of the plants he talks about are species plants. They're not naturally bred. They're not created. These are naturally occurring. This is a, a Tacoma, which is a plant in the Southwest. That's the common name as well. Tacoma stands, very proliferous. It'll bloom probably for about nine months out of the year. And it's probably one of the best pollinators you can have in your garden. Um, this last year, I identified four different varieties of bumblebee on uh, the Tacoma I had. And then we had numerous different uh, species of honeybees. Absolutely magnet. I used to draw the car up right beside this plant. And then I used to roll the window down and I'd take pictures of all these insects. And they, uh, we used to have, we'd have some hermit bees and hermit bees, they're the size of the end of your thumb. 
and the hermit bees would fly that fly into the car and they come and check you out they do they'll, they'll they'll hover like three or four inches in front of you and they fly around your face and they check you out and then they just go back to the bush again our gardens have got to become more sustainable this is a uh, my sister lives in malta this typical maltese garden where everything just grows over itself but everything thrives everything has the same water needs has the same soil needs you might fertilize it once a year the soil is so poor out there and of course everyone is growing fruit the gardens that we create whether we create them in california or upstate new york we need to be planting plants that sustain what you're looking at now is a typical southwestern planting in the foreground is the butelia blonde ambition the original plant the plant, the taller plant with the beautiful plumes is a deer grass or called Mullenbergia. And then the flowering plant is Agastache or Agastache, depending on where you're from. Numerous different varieties, lots of different colors. It's an American native in some of the regions. So, you know, we, we have a, a long way to go. And so books, you know, I must confess, um, I, I didn't put my picture in of the uh, of magazines, but I can run through them quickly. We all need to have a library. And if you don't have a library, please start. So here are a, a few of some of the suggestions. This is called Pretty Tough Plants. And it's written, uh, the, the authors, uh, is the Denver Botanical Garden. The chances are you're only going to be able to find this online. And if you buy it, keep it. Uh, and then will it to somebody. It's a unique plant. The plant descriptions, the photographs, and the hand drawings are spectacular. And so many of these plants, although they're grown um, up in, the, uh, in Colorado at a mile high, they work beautifully in the lower, warmer regions. Deborah Lee Baldwin, the self-professed um, queen of succulents, Deborah Baldwin, has written three or four books on succulents and succulent design. And again, a great read supported by terrific narrative. Our own Nan Stearman from Southern California, who is a member of our society, uh, has written numerous books. This is, this is one of her latest. And again, I think this is a must have, hot color dry garden. Uh, Nan traveled from California all the way through to West Texas and up into New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, taking pictures of gardens very much on the dry side, but showing fantastic displays of color. The first half of the book is photography supported by some narrative. The second half of the book is an encyclopedia. Many of the plants that she mentions in the first half or has taken pictures of, she has a picture of them, and then she goes into great detail of each plant, how it performs, and how to use it in the garden. Trees and Shrubs for the Southwest by Mary Irish. Mary Irish, one of the great plants women of the Southwest, um, designed many fabulous gardens and uh, also wrote two or three books. So lots of uh, good reading there. And then the most moving book I think I've ever read. In the last uh, few years, I've had the a uh, great opportunity to get involved in horticultural therapy. Horticultural therapy was quite trendy, right? Um, it was thought it was kind of a thing to do. Horticultural therapy is now a cultural shift in the United States of America and many, many areas of the world. Horticultural therapy owes its roots to the Europeans. That's where the whole idea of using plants started and using them in wellness programs. You'll find gardens in hospitals, senior centers, wellness centers, doctors, doctor's offices outside, whatever it might be. This particular book goes through various gardens in the United States of America, whether they are in prisons, whether they are in blighted areas of uh, Chicago or Minneapolis, wherever it might be. And it is one of the most emotional reads that I've ever done. It's a, it's a terrific book. So that's it. Thank you for joining me. This gives you a glimpse of what we're doing in America. And I, I, I do thank you, Angela, for inviting me to present. It's, uh, it's probably the high spot of my year. Thank you. Oh, I think that's a slight indictment. It's a, 
very, very great pleasure to have listened to you. I um, think that there were several um, questions on the chat and I would like to ask either Maggie or Yvonne if you could read those out because I think that those were whipping past us. Um, um, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen now, thank you, Nicholas. Okay, okay. And we'll go back into the sort of gallery view. There we go. There we go. So uh, is uh, has any is either Maggie or Yvonne there? Maggie. I'm here, Angela. Oh, could, um, you, could you yeah. do me a favor and read them up? There were some questions yeah. coming up. There was quite a few, wasn't there? Yeah. Um, there was a bit of discussion about whether US growers were allowed to send seed to the MGS seed exchange. Oh. Um, and Chantelle, who is knows exactly all about this, says no seed coming from outside Europe can be imported in Europe without a phytosanitary certificate. Oh. So that's, uh, that tells us about uh, uh, how we can get seed from America. Um, and, 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 and Maggie, if I may, my apologies. The phytosanitaries really are, they're not difficult to obtain. And so that, that's a fairly easy process. Okay, great. So that would be good news for us. Yes, but I'm, so, I'm sorry. Can I answer to this? Can yes. oh. I answer to this? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, uh, as I am running the the seed list exchanging for MGS, um, I think for myself that, that uh, it could be as I I am alone to do that to do that job, and I think that it would be too much complicated for me to do that. To ask, uh, I can I can try. I could try, but. Um, French uh, rules are very complicated and they are not very easy to deal with because the French French um, institutions uh, like very much papers. They, they, they do a lot of papers there. <laughs> so it's it's always a lot of fuss for for, the, for for doing this. You understand what I mean? Perhaps I can I can try to ask. To... Yeah. Could I? So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I just uh, so um, Chantal, do you ever get uh, seeds from any one of our members in America? Do you receive them? I should not tell that. Okay, no. The answer is no. I have, I have <laughs> my, I have my uh, own. Uh, I'm going very, very often to US. I mean, every two years I go to US. So mm. <laughs> I do my okay. things. I do my things. So can we I, should possibly can I, move on from that one then. <laughs> yeah. re re really quickly, I'll make a few inquiries with some pal of, pals of mine. And let, let's see if we can find a bridge for this. Right. Okay. 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 Uh, the next question is about Oasis Gardens that you were describing to us um, and how they coordinate with fire restrictive plantings. Ah, yeah, well, um, there are no hard and fast rules and regulations providing uh, fire restrictions. Uh, the fire departments have approved lists of, of plants and the in somewhere like Las Vegas, my thought is there are no there are no restrictions whatsoever in what you have around your house. The fire restrictions are much more draconian in California. So, for instance, where I live, then uh, the local fire department inspects our properties uh, anywhere from one to three times a year, and they will give you a written warning as to what they want you to do with your property. And if you fail to do that, then you're fined and a local contractor comes in and will clear your ground. Wow. So they, they, they also have maps. You know, there are various um, or diagrams you can buy about plantings to put around your house and suggesting. So um, in, in, in California, is that, that's where they really do a lot of work with that. Can I add to that? 
Yeah, Nan, Nan is got her hand up. Yeah. So I live about, I don't know, an hour south of Nicholas, maybe something like that here in California. And I'm in addition to writing and whatever, I also design gardens. And one of the things that's happening is that the designers are being told that we will no longer be able to design plants for um, an envelope around the house that starts right up the structure and goes out five feet. I'm not very happy about this, but um, so we've we've got you know kind of what Nicholas is describing an envelope of in, of planting that will be limited to, but the first five feet from the house out can't be plants. So the the planting space is kind of being squeezed from both sides. Um, it'll be interesting to watch and see what happens. Okay, um, the, the next question is about what's desirable about the annualization of perennials? Which I think was from Nan. Yes. <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a personal basis, I, I would never plant another, uh, another annual. Um, they're just too foo-foo for me. I can't find a better word. And the amount of perennials which are just magnificent. You know, one, they're gonna come back uh, year after year after year. Many of the perennials are very long lived. They, um, you know, I think they're larger, they're more proliferous. They add more uh, diversity to the garden. They, they add more diversity to the containers. Um, you know, many of the perennials, you can harvest the blooms, you can harvest the stems, you can bring them indoors. Um, you know, to use for your cut flower arrangements. You've got uh, perennials that bloom uh, all the seasons through the year. So I think the diversity is fantastic. Annual sales, depending on, on who you're talking to, that there really is a shift away from annuals in, in many parts of America. Right. So that, that's, a, that's a long-winded answer to the question. <laughs> Um, there's there's a lot of uh, comments thanking you very much for the really interesting presentation, Nicholas. And oh, um, a little bit of information for people. Um, Emma Bannister just downloaded Pretty Tough Plants on Kindle Unlimited by Amazon. It's included oh. apparently in the Kindle Unlimited fee and it's great. So anybody with Kindle Unlimited, there's an opportunity to look at that one. Um, I think that's all the questions that are on the chat, Angela. Well done, uh, Maggie. Thanks very okay. much. So now, if anyone would have, to, uh, would like to speak to, you know, uh, ask a, a, a live question um, to Nicholas. Uh, I think I had some. Oh yes, when you can I can I just ask uh, one myself, please. Oh um, yeah. So, yeah. so you're talking about the farm in Oregon, and you were saying that the the water is it's a it's a self contained ecosystem. It goes yes. It mustn't run off. Is yes. that because so, of yeah yeah? So so there's a nurseries. Uh, there are a number of states in America that require growing operations to have a closed water system. And that's to say um, it's, uh, it's, it's the right thing to do to contain your water, to save your water. Uh, nurseries do use some chemicals and they also do use fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of mitigating those chemicals and fertilizers. So during the recycling process, you can identify as the water is put on to the crops, and then it goes into the recycling system, into the underground canal. As the water goes back into the reservoirs, the water is monitored and you can identify the level of chemicals and you can identify the levels of fertilizer in there as well. So, um, yep, so you can, that's where you either add or you subtract. And then you can also, uh, you also add a certain amount of fresh water in there. Um, Florida, the state of Florida, and, and I, I think this is, um, this is going to become a major topic at some point. I think some of you will have probably heard about the terrible die-off of the reefs around Florida. Um, you know, at one, one of the reasons is the water temperature. This year, believe it or not, we had water temperature of 100 degrees 
around the Floridian uh, coast. So the, the reefs can't, they, they can't adjust to that, but they can't adjust to the amount of fertilizer that is washing off the farms and uh, off the golf courses and off the nurseries into the water. So the algae is absolutely thriving on all the nitrogen that's in the water. So we we need to take this in check and not, not, to, not to make this political, but it's very important that the growers take this in hand themselves. There are certain things that people need to do in order to do the right thing. Um, I, I work with a group in California uh, which pertains to invasive plants. We're, we have a huge problem with invasive plants in America all over. So one of the things that uh, we do in this group is to work on the voluntary removal of invasive plants from nursery production. And over the last 10 years or so, it's been a, it really has been a very successful program. And we've got some, uh, you know, like Randy Baldwin, so, who I mentioned, Randy is part of this group. And, you know, you, you've got good support for things like this. Thank you. I just had another question too about the palms in Florida. Oh, um, yeah. so you're not uh, subject to any of the pests that we are seeing in Europe? We, to, to, yes. We, so, um, Angela, this is a terrific question. I, um, I, I can do more research on this. I am not, I'm not up on my palms. But in California and also in Florida, we, we are having, um, you know, Nan might be able to answer this question better than I. There are, there are numerous issues and pestilence with palms. And the, Nan, can you take this question about pestilence on palms? Yeah, I can tell you what we're finding here is a South American palm weevil, which is a weevil that's about an inch and a half long, maybe almost two inches is very nasty, is started on all the Canary Island palms, which are fantastic, giant, beautiful palms, you know, widely represented out throughout California. Um, and they, what happens is you you see one of these giant palms and from the top, it all flops down. It looks like a wet dog. And what happens is the weevils get into the, the, um, the top of the palms, the growing stem, and they lay their eggs. When the eggs hatch out, the grubs eat that meristem. And that hmm. destroys the growing part of the palm. And eventually it just makes a big mess. The palms die. And you don't notice it until it's too late. I mean, literally, you cannot see it until it's too late. And we, it, I'm in San Diego area. Basically, it's just it's just one after the next, after the next, after the next. I mean, we're not going to have Canary Island palms here. And we are hearing reports of them um, also infecting other palms not widely um, seems to me Bismarckia nobilis, I've heard, and um, Dipsis dicarii, which is the triangle palm. But I haven't heard any official word about that. Just people saying, oh, yes, I think it's happened here. I think it's happened there. But the Canary Island palms, which are a major palm, is a huge issue. And I think, Nicholas, isn't it a, there a huge concern about getting to the date palms in the desert? Oh, really? I, I, you know, again, this is hearsay, but it wouldn't surprise me one bit if that were to happen. Yeah, I have not right. heard, <clears throat> I've not heard about the the um, South American palm weevil and affecting our native. We only have one native palm, even though California is filled with palms. There's only one palm native to California. It's native to the desert areas. Which um, is, is called? Uh, it's Washingtonian. Which Washingtonian is it? Nicholas. Uh, uh, Filifera. Filifera, thank you. Because the other yeah. one is Robusta, which is an invasive from uh, Mexico. So Washingtonia filifera is our native palm. It's only native to desert oases, nowhere else in the state. But um, it'd be great if it got to the Washingtonia um, Robusta, because those are just a nuisance. But oh well. <laughs> Okay. So that's, yeah, in, that's every, in every in every cloud, there's a, a silver lining. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, uh, I mean, uh, over here, I, we've obviously seen devastation, um, and I'm I'm not up on because of course you can't tell what's going on until it is too late. Um, but there are preventative um, treatments. Uh, not not really. Not really. 
you know, there are people who are spending a whole lot of money on trying to keep their um, Canary Island poems and uh, nothing. No. The, the the jury is out as to whether it's working or just delaying the inevitable. Yeah, we were having people drench their drench from the top and then big syringes and you know I I don't know if anyone in Europe wants to speak about this. I'm not an expert, but it is quite devastating to to witness if you're living on a coastal in a coastal area. Oh. And in terms of international plant exchanging and plant cooperation, you know, obviously yeah. some of some of us believe that some of these new pests that we're having to coexist with are due to the fact that there is such traffic, um, uh, perhaps not of plants themselves, but of other um, living organisms that are causing these new arrivals. Um, really? Is there massive you know what's the sort of legislation uh at a global level what are, is anybody doing anything to well there is that there's a that there's a lot of collaboration between the various countries and the agricultural and the horticultural institutions whether it's you know private or governmental yeah. and uh -huh. we're, we're so many uh we've we have a um we have a bore over here called emerald ash bore um, an emerald ash borer originated, uh, I believe, in uh, China, I think. And uh, em the way emerald ash borer got into the United States was in packing material. And I believe it was in uh, Pennsylvania. So someone shipped in a whole bunch of, I don't know, airplane parts or car parts or something. And the packing that was used was ash chips, right, to cushion everything. And in there was the emerald ash borer. And emerald ash borer has pretty much wiped out um, all the ash trees mm. on the East Coast in the Midwest and has now been found in Oregon. So it will come down into California and we will lose many of our ash trees. So there's a lot of uh, pestilence and disease that piggybacks on, you know, on people, suitcases, on their shoes, you know, clothes, whatever it might be. And the other thing is the um, illegal importation of plants. We have, uh, we have a disease called uh, citrus greening. And the citrus greening was uh, brought into Florida and has actually decimated about 50% of the citrus in the industry there. And we, we actually have the psyllid that, that carries the disease now in California. So, uh, you know, if, if the psyllid is ever found, then there's a quarantine that is quickly put up around those areas. And it, it's uh, potentially, it, it, it could wipe out our citrus crop here. But the way that the particular, how the, the disease was brought into the country, the how they found out was unbelievable. So um, citrus greening was discovered in Florida and a team of experts uh, from Washington went down to Florida and one of them, uh, one of these chaps I knew, so they were working in the various citrus groves, et cetera, et cetera. And they were out to dinner one night in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in an Asian restaurant. Um, they fell into conversation with the owner of the restaurant and he asked what they're doing there and he told them and he, he said, oh, he said, I have a lemon tree out back that's looking really poorly, have a look at it. So they looked at this lemon tree, and uh, sure enough, it was it was um, had uh, is it Wolong Dong is the right word, Nan? Um, oh shoot! If you hadn't said that, I would tell you. I think it's Huilong Gong. H L B. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Hong uh, so, Hong Long Wong. I can't remember now. Sorry, if you hadn't like. said that, Nicholas, I would I would have been able to tell you right away. Something like that. So anyway, so they go out back and they look at this. Wang uh, Long this... Bing, I think it is. I think it's Wang Long Bing. That okay. sounds good. Bad help. So I'm I'm a little off with Wo Long Dong then. Okay, so I'll, <laughs> I'll work I'll okay. I'll work on that. Sorry. So anyway, they go out back and they look at this guy's citrus tree, and it was it was had citrus greening, and they asked where he got the uh, the original budding wood from. He got the original budding wood from Vietnam. 
had it shipped over illegally. And that's how citrus greening got into the United States of America. That was the original tree. So there's a, there's a, a lot of illegal importation of uh, plants and, and also animals as well. It's, uh, mm. yeah, it's a bad, it's a bad do. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, let's not end on a dark note. Oh, um, no. Let's end on a big thank you to Nicholas. Um, I think that was a fascinating presentation. It's a different point of view and it's very, very welcome because of that. Thank you. Um, thank you. I have 10 out of 12 speakers lined up for next year. So I'll be publishing that list for you. Um, and I hope that we will continue to see each other once uh, once a month um, next year. And thank, thank you, you all for supporting, um, you know, the talks. It, uh, I think it's, it, it's great. It's different to our journal. Um, and um, I think it's been a good initiative and thanks to May COVID. I, one good thing to come out of COVID perhaps. Yes, Nan. I just wanted to thank you. This is <laughs> oh, one of the yes. best series of webinars of any that I have participated in since yeah. before COVID. The talks you, the people you found to present and the talks that you have uh, curated have been stellar in every way. And I'm just very, very thankful because you've given me exposure to people and things happening around the world that I otherwise wouldn't know about, but I think about them now. It's like they're in my designs, they're in my talks, they're in my presentations, they're in the way I advise people. And it 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 really makes a difference. I, I don't know that you realize how much of a difference you're making. And I really want to thank you for that. Well, that's very much appreciated. Perfect. Really glad to hear it. I'm very, very glad to hear it. Okay, so thank you, Nan. Thanks for uh, for that. Um, so, okay, so happy holidays and um, happy new year. And we'll see you on uh, January the 10th around that, the second Wednesday of January. Um, and first up is Michael McCorrie from Australia. So there'll be a slightly different time and I can't remember for the life of me, it's very, it was an intense planning program to see how we could get three continents to talk at the same time. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think we might lose, we might have to lose some Americans. I'm sorry. I think it might be impossible for you unless you're very, very keen. Um, but since they don't, the Australians don't get to hear our regular presentations, I think it's a slight, um, it, it just it just doesn't work very easily. However, they're all obviously on YouTube, as you all know. Um, so again, Nicholas, thank you. That was marvelous. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. And thank for you. saving the day. And thanks to you all. Cheers. And Cheers. See you soon. Okay. okay thank Take you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.